Thank you for joining us today. Just a very few quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. If you're using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to com complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Natsuko Inui. Take it away, Natsuko. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Natsuko Inui, and I will be moderating this session today. The session you are at now is Bridging the Gap on SBOM, Collaborating for Software Component Transparency. Um, just one item before we get started. So you will see a QA and a um, icon or box on your screen. Um, we ask that you submit your questions through that Q&A box as you will all be muted. Um, questions will be queued up in the order received, and we will address them um, at the end in the Q&A. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I'd like to introduce our speakers today. So we have Dr. Alan Friedman, um, who is Director of Cybersecurity at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration in the US Department of Commerce. And he coordinates the NTIA's multi-stakeholder processes on cybersecurity, um, convening cross-sector working groups with a focus on resilience in a vulnerable ecosystem. Um, we have another speaker who is from Japan, uh, Mr. Tomo Ito. So Tomo Ito has been working as a vulnerability information coordinator at JBCC for four years now. And his current focuses include um, international collaborations regarding vulnerab vulnerability coordination topics with organizations around the globe. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Alan and Tomo. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, hello, welcome to our presentation, Bridging the Gap on S1. Uh, many of you probably have heard of SBOM already, but today we are going to talk about uh, how different organizations are working on this topic and the good things that came out of it. So Natsuko has kindly introduced us, but very briefly, uh, I run NTIA cybersecurity initiatives, including uh, the global SBOM work. Uh, now I started working at JP Store CC about uh, five years ago, actually, uh, as vendor's email address finder. And I'm now a CVD coordinator, and I also lead international collaboration projects. So the challenge with virtual conferences is not only do we have to be more interesting than all the other fascinating talks going on right now, but we have to be more interesting than literally the entire internet. Uh, so we'll try to keep you entertained and engaged today. We're going to start off uh, by giving you an overview of SBOM. Some of you may know about it already, but we're gonna give you some of the motivating factors as well as a brief overview of what do we mean when we talk about software bill of materials. Now we'll touch on topics like uh, how JP Search sees SBOM and the survey we took from the vendors, as well as the next steps for Japanese community along with Alan. So the core takeaways today are going to be, uh, depending a little bit on where you sit, if you wear a cert hat, uh, SBOMs, as Tomo is going to highlight, are, can be a powerful tool to assist with coordination. If you're on the product security side, we want you to appreciate that SBOMs are coming. Uh, this is going to be how we do business uh, and can be incredibly powerful for efficiency and efficacy. But this is your chance to roll up your sleeves and really shape what that future looks like. And indeed, if anyone's interested about the future of security and software, uh, we're going to need your help to demonstrate this technology uh, but the technical side and the operational side works the way that we intend it to do. So start with a couple of examples. Um, some of you have heard of a vulnerability that was discovered in 2019, 2019 uh, called the uh, Urgent 11 vulnerabilities. It was originally thought to be a flaw in a real-time operating system called VxWorks. Now, the problem with real-time operating systems is they're usually buried deep in some embedded device. You look at that device, and if you're lucky enough to have a name on the side of it, it's not going to say what the underlying operating system is. Often, the real-time operating system is buried several levers below. And then it turns out, for this vulnerability, it wasn't just in this one RTOS. It was actually in others. And one of the really fascinating things about dealing with vulnerabilities, even in 2020, is surprisingly few organizations can quickly and easily answer a very basic question. Am I affected? When we discover a vulnerability, does this affect me? We think that is just a, a, not a very sustainable way of doing business today. 
I want to talk about a second story, uh, which is this very nice guy, Shlomi, who's the CEO of a small Israeli company called JSOF. They made some headlines this year and presented at, at DEF CON uh, about uh, a vulnerability that they found in uh, a Trek IP library, a very small library, uh, that they termed the vulnerabilities, the Ripple 20. Now, the challenge was not the hard work that they did to find this vulnerability. They had some equipment in the lab that sort of said, okay, we know it's in this device. But when they wanted to actually disclose it to the vendors, when they wanted to say, hey, uh, we think that your product might be affected, they didn't know who to reach out to. They were forced to go on LinkedIn uh, and scour LinkedIn looking for anyone who was bragging about their uh, chops in the Trek IP stack, figure out where that person worked and then say, well, maybe that person is using Trek IP. So maybe they're affected and we should notify them. And finding vendors contact is one of the uh, challenges that JP CC is facing. Uh, this is why I, I was hired to JP CC in the first place. And when doing this, sometimes we look through open forums or we guess the email address or use stuff like Wayback Machine. So I think I know what kind of hassle should Lomi have to go through on this. So how do we solve this? <clears throat> Here's a solution. And, but what is an S-bomb? And I would like to first, I would first like to make sure that this is not super bad of me, the racing that's happening in Japan, but it's like a Java application library list, but with uh, software components. So to get a little more detailed, uh, the community has come up with a, uh, a basic definition, which is an SBOM is a formal record containing the details and supply chain relationships of various components used in building software. Now, in effect, it amounts to a list of ingredients. Uh, you go to the store, you buy a piece of candy, it's gonna come with a list of ingredients. Uh, why don't we expect the same amount of information from our software? Another way of thinking about it is, uh, you know, it's just a dependency graph. So in this toy example we have on the screen, Acme Appliance or Acme Application uh, has two dependencies, Bingo Buffer and Bob's Browser. Uh, and in turn, Bob's Browser, we know, depends on Carol's compression engine. Now, there are a couple of things to note here. First is we try to be explicit about what was known and what's unknown. So for example, in this case, we know that Carol's compression engine doesn't have any further dependencies. On the other hand, bingo buffer may or may not. We simply don't know. So this means that no one has to be perfect. Exactly. So by being explicit about the information that we have, folks can sort of ship what they have. And when you get an SBOM, you can now say, um, okay, this is the information I have and this is the information I don't. Now, hopefully you can see uh, it's not covered up under the Zoom windows, uh, but for each of these components, we don't need that much information. Now, some of you are very, very sophisticated. You've got a lot of information about your supply chain, but to maximize the ease of adoption, we start off with a very uh, straightforward model. Uh, the minimum viable or the core SBOM doesn't require too much information. For each of these components, we need who the supplier is, what's the name of the component, What's the version so that we know if it's a vulnerable or non-vulnerable version? And then what's the hash so that Tomo can be confident that he and I are talking about the same version and I'm not using some random backdoor version from GitHub. So not that much information, but with this information, we think you can do a lot. Now SBOM won't magically fix anyone's problems, but with this data, it's going to enable a lot of very critical security use cases. Uh, and the range depends and what it can do depends on the hat that you wear because software follows a very clear life cycle, right? Some of us uh, make software, some of us choose software, buy software, some of us operate software, most of us operate software at some level. And SBOM can help you whatever that role is. So for example, if you're making software, it's very hard to claim that you have a secure development model if you aren't tracking what components you're using, right? SBOMs allow you to use allow lists and deny lists to track end of life, things like that. If you're in the business of managing the risk, whether it's about supply chain or general risk management, SBOM can really be very helpful too. Uh, it's hard to claim that you are thinking about where your software is coming from if you can't see that dependency tree. 
And it's hard to claim that you've thought thoroughly about the risk if you don't know that, hey, while this component is fine, it in turn depends on something upstream that I don't know anything about, or even worse, has some red flags. So you need that visibility of the supply chain. And then finally, of course, uh, vulnerability management. And Tomo is going to talk a lot more about this, but it amounts to not being able to defend what you don't know about. So what have we tried to do? Well, NTIA for the last two years has convened an international multi-sector initiative on software component transparency to create a shared vision of what SBOM looks like. Part of the challenge is we simply didn't have this common vision, so no one was able to really drive forward. Now, the scope of this is quite ambitious. We're trying to tackle the entire supply chain, right? This isn't just an open source problem. It's not just a commercial software problem. It's not just an embedded problem, although uh, certainly for things like uh, medical devices or industrial control systems, um, it's very important because there's less visibility in those spaces. And of course, uh, the customers need to be involved in well. This isn't transparency for its own sake. The vision here is to make sure uh, that the data that we're sharing is, is, is applicable and useful. And as I touched on, this is something that needs to cross all sectors. We all use the same software. And in fact, one of the real dangers that we saw is seeing a unique solution for the automotive sector and the energy sector and what governments buy, because that put the potential to create a lot of waste or potentially have a fragment the ecosystem. So we wanted to make sure that we maintain the idea that we're all using the same software. To do this, NTIA has convened what we call the multi-stakeholder process. It's open, it's transparent, it's consensus-based. Uh, the pen is held by the community, NTI just facilitates it, and we help everyone hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Um, but it has led to some great progress across the ecosystem. And in fact, in addition to sort of describing the issue, we're starting to focus on implementation. We didn't want to create a brand new standard. Uh, and the good news was that there were already a couple standards out there. Uh, so the bad news is that there are multiple standards out there. Uh, these are very powerful. We're happy to chat more about these. Uh, each of them have some respective strengths. Uh, so for example, SWID tags are an ISO standard, as well as some drawbacks. So for example, SPDX and Cyclone DX uh, have much more active current development communities, uh, folks trying to figure out how to use this today. And what we've done is to focus on identifying the common elements. So we're not trying to pick a winner here. Uh, it's not a job NTIA nor JP CC. Exactly. So our vision here is to really uh, emphasize the interoperability between them. And in fact, uh, some participants, uh, including uh, VJ from uh, CERT CC at Carnegie Mellon, has developed a tool that can maximize interoperability. So you can feed it an SBOM in one format and it'll spit it out in another. The goal here is to make sure that uh, people can pick what they want and the ecosystem can still thrive. And speaking of translation uh, in a multilingual uh, ecosystem, this is not only about the US or English speaking countries, uh, this is a global topic. And this is the reason why JP CC is interested in this topic. So speaking of ourself, <clears throat> uh, we are an independent organization and our vote coordination activity, CVD activity, is funded by the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. And by the way, the government is showing a strong interest on SBOM also, and it is being discussed in a, a task force and study group meetings all hosted by them. And back to yourself, uh, we do vote coordination under a Japanese framework. Uh, also receive reports from overseas directly, and we work with other national certs and publish advisories on our website. So why, we need, why do we need SBOM? Uh, we often handle multi-party coordination cases where many vendors are involved. And I'm just gonna call it MPCVD here. And for MPCVDs, uh, vendors involvement is essential because the information does, if the information doesn't get to the affected vendors, what is the point of doing this? And I know in the audience, there are some people from large vendors that do, uh, that do MPCVD on their own and JP CC, we do the same or very similar things with you. And so in MPCVD, we decide where to send the information. And for that, we pick out the vendors. And when doing this, uh, we pick out the vendors by keywords, which they pick when they register to our framework. And other than this, we depend on our people's knowledge and memories. 
And as you can see, uh, this is not the most accurate and fastest way of picking up vendors. We need more accuracy and more speed when doing this. So we, we feel that SBOM and the transparency that it will bring would give clear directions for both coordinators and the vendors. Thank you. <clears throat> and to tackle this issue, we took a survey from vendors here in Japan. We notified, uh, we sent notification to 318 vendors, uh, some active, some non-active and 57 vendors completed the answers. Uh, we are happy with the result, <clears throat> but as you can see, this is not a large number. So starting with this, we will try expanding the number of both the total and the answering vendors uh, through discussions and promotions. So you can see by the numbers, uh, this is not all opinions of J Japanese vendors, but it helped us to understand the rough trends. And from the next slide, I will show some of the answers that they gave us. And by the way, if anyone would like to know more about the survey and have discussions on this, we, will like, we would be more than happy to. All right. <clears throat> So from the survey uh, on vol handling, we asked them if they would investigate when they receive or obtain information from whatever the sources are. And thank God most vendors said they investigate. 85% said yes. And we asked them if the time needed to make decisions uh, for correspondence for the issue. And there were various answers from an hour to four weeks. And many coordination cases are disclosed before four weeks. So I can see some speed challenges here. And we also asked what their challenges are in CVD. And several, 36% said finding, obtaining the information is a challenge. And for this, uh, how are they going to find out their relationships with the issue if they don't know what they have in their hands? So here's another tie to SBOM. And the other free writing answers included things like component management, automation, piece of resources. And also we asked them if they would consider fix for non-exploitable looking issues. And more than half, 64% said yes. And this topic is currently being discussed in SBOM working groups as uh, VEX issues. So these are obvious ties to SBOM. And about third party components, uh, most vendors use third-party components in their products, 94%. So this is a norm today. And 61% of them create component lists. And another question, if the vendors have been requested to provide component lists from external organizations, such as customers, for this, several vendors said they have uh, 36%. And again, how, how are they going to do this if they don't know what they have in their hands? And as for component naming, we asked the vendors if they modify the names of the components that they use. And 24% said uh, they modify the component names. And there's an issue here, lack of a global naming list. And this is currently being discussed in SBOM working groups as well. So let's see SBOM. Uh, we asked them if they know of SBOM and SBOM is well known. More than half, uh, 56 percent said they know of SBOM. Some in detail, some just overviews, but some uh, we can say that it's pretty famous. And vendors' opinions for it, uh, there was almost no objection. Just one vendor saying uh, no to it, and this was only if the information must go public. <clears throat> and another vendor, uh, one vendor said uh, they are already using SBOM, so which I think is a uh, Awesome. Then we asked the vendors if they would like to have us, JPCC, give guidance on SBOM, and more than half said yes, so we can see some enough interest here. So vendors value transparency. Uh, from the survey, we saw that the vendors face challenges of CVD cost and speed and PCR efficiency, and there are needs for asset management and there was no, almost no objections from the, uh, for the idea of SBOM and there were interests for SBOM guidance. So we can say that there's enough uh, needs and interest here. So <clears throat> since we identified the needs uh, for SBOM, where's the gap that needs to be filled? Uh, speaking of ourselves, uh, JPCRCC's current focus, or we can say it's our mission 
is that is to embed the CVD culture more here in Japan. Uh, there are many spaces left for CVD adoption compared to, uh, compared to countries like the United States. And also from the survey, you can see that there are many challenges that PSERTs are facing. So what do we use? SBOM. So we would like to use SBOM as a CVD adoption tool, starting point for beginners and level up for more matured PSERTs. And for this, at this point, we need guidance material and starter kit. And as for the concerns, uh, there are some concerns the vendors or that we have, and one of them is who should have the access to SBOM data. Uh, lots of people when, uh, want data from the upstream, and this can be a challenge in the beginning, but we would like to encourage that it, uh, it is being shared from the downstream as well, and the data flows in both directions in the supply chain. And we are also curious if the vendors will share the SBOM data with JPSERCC. And this is because, it's in the next page. <clears throat> After all these, we would like to build a cooperative CVD system using uh, SBOM and make our coordination much faster with the automation aspect of SBOM. And I believe that the possible drastic increasing of speed of bulk coordination using SBOM will only help the, not only help, will help the vendors, but also the society through the CD, uh, CBD stakeholders, including the vendors. So what are the next steps for the broader SBOM community? Uh, I wanna be clear uh, and not overstate that this is a completely mature technology, in fact, quite the opposite. The benefit is we're figuring it out together. So Tomo touched on some of the issues that we're currently working on, such as how do we tackle the question of software namespace, right? Use com.sun.java or com.oracle.java. We don't have a single way of talking about software. In fact, the problem isn't a lack of a standard for software identity. It's the fact that we have multiple ones and we're all using them slightly differently. Uh, similarly, how are we going to share this SBOM data uh, with our partners? As Tomo uh, flagged, uh, there are going to be different needs, different demands, different things that different parties are comfortable with. Um, we don't want to find a single solution. We're not going to force everyone to do everything the same way, but we think that we can provide some guidance to say, here's a small set of ways to do it so that customers and suppliers uh, aren't doing a million different things. Last issue I want to flag is this question of vulnerability versus exploitability. Those of you in the PSERT world know that there are going to be vulnerabilities in an underlying component that simply don't affect your customers. The way you've used it or built it doesn't allow that vulnerability to be exploited. There's an ongoing work to figure out how, in addition to SBOM, suppliers can communicate downstream the lack of exploitability in a way that they're comfortable with. So beyond thinking about the architectural issues, uh, we're focusing on building this today. So what tools exist? There already are a number of them. Uh, some of them are open source, some of them are commercial that are able to generate SBOMs and consume SBOMs in the data formats that we already talked about. Moreover, we're interested in sort of helping folks learn how to use this, both getting the message out, and if you're interested today, we'd love to have you involved, um, thinking about draft contract language, so you can start to ask for SBOMs from your suppliers today, uh, as well as proof of concept exercises, so that folks uh, can show that this works for their community. Over the last two years, the healthcare sector in the United States has actually been doing this. And it's a sign of how important it is to that community that in the middle of all of this, in the middle of the world's worst public health crisis, um, this is something that remains a priority to American medical device manufacturers or rather international medical device manufacturers and American hospitals. Uh, there are other sectors that are starting to ramp up on this, including for example, the automotive sector, which is going to have participants from uh, uh, Japan and Germany, as well as the United States. And lastly, we're focused on thinking about these playbooks and how-to guides that Tomo talked about. Um, we wanna make sure that if you're interested, you won't have to start from scratch, that there'll be some tools that you can use to pick up and say, all right, if I do it this way, here's my next step. If I do it this way, here's my next step. And that's an emerging part that we're focusing on. You're on mute, Tomo. No worries. Sorry about that. Uh, so the next steps in Japan will be on uh, start SBOM adoption using guidance materials and starter kits, and also have more discussions on SBOM, for example, the vendor meetings that we host uh, twice a year. 
and also localization. And that is, we are planning on reviewing and giving inputs to the documents created by the SPOM Adoption Working Group and translate them into Japanese language. So what's the future of SPOM? Uh, the vision here is first to say that, you know, this is coming. Uh, this is going to be something, uh, you know, organizations can already produce partial SBOMs today. The goal of the broader community is to see what we can do to make this an expectation in the marketplace, uh, to help people say, oh, this is something that I'm going to be asked for, and then I can start to look for to help defend my product. And to make that a reality, we need to make it easier and cheaper to generate SBOMs, uh, as well as more efficient and effective to consume this data, which means slotting it into the various tools on both the production side as well as the consumption side. And we're building that ecosystem around it today, right? As I said, SBOM isn't going to solve all of our problems, uh, but we think that with this data, it can really slot in. Now, there's a great role for this community to play, both for the CERT and the PCERT level. Um, so for example, promoting these proof of concept exercises that I talked about, uh, identifying obstacles. So as we start to think through it, what are some things I'm worried about? Um, what are some of the solutions? And of course, uh, signaling interest in adoption. So for example, uh, Enisa just published some guidance on IoT supply chain security, where they explicitly called out SBOMs, not just as a technical issue, but as a process issue we should start thinking about. Awesome. Hey. One thing I would like to add is that, you know, SBOM has been brought up and discussed in the ISO world as well. And so, if you would like to know more or get involved, uh, there are some documents that are published at ntia.gov slash SBOM. These are not written by the American government. These are written by the community. Uh, they've been drafted by these open international working groups. Uh, they've had feedback. Tomo gets up and stays up all night for our quarterly multi-stakeholder meetings uh, and is able to weigh in. We really appreciate that. Someday we'll do it on your time. Uh, and if you want to know about the process, ntia.gov slash software transparency, the next meeting will be held uh, in early January. You'll be announcing that. Uh, and you can send me an email to get on my uh, broadcast announcement list. If you reach out to both of us to start the conversation, what I'll do is I'll send you a sticker. That's the way that you know that you're a cool InfoSec project is we have stickers. Uh, and so if you reach out to us to start the conversation, even if it's just to say that we're idiots, um, we want to start that conversation and engage with you and your team. Uh, and, and then you can, uh, you know, have some fun things on your laptops. So with that, uh, I think we have some time for questions. And so uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you again, Lynn and Tomo. So we have two minutes. So let's see how many we can get. <laughs> we'll go through them um, quickly. Okay. So can't we use NVD's common product illumination CPE for software namespace? It's a great question. Uh, the short version is that is one of the solutions. People are also using things like package URL or Perl. The other challenge is our friends at NIST have publicly said that they're gonna be deprecating CPE in favor of something called SWID. Uh, and the challenge there is we don't have full guidance. So while CPE is useful for mapping, other people are using other solutions today. Um, and as you mentioned it, so any idea when NIST will transition away from CP to SWID? Um, you know, my friends at NIST have a lot of things on their plate. I know this is a key priority for them. Uh, one of the challenges is SWID, as it's currently written, doesn't allow wildcarding, which CPE does. And so they're working on that. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Bangart and uh, Walter Meyer, super smart guys, and they're, they're working on it. We know it. Okay, in other words, we don't know at the moment. Okay, so <laughs> it was mentioned that there was a tool that converted between different formats. I missed that uh, where uh, that was, uh, I missed where that was or what uh, that was. Should, you, should we share that information? I will try to share that. I'm looking up the URL now um, it, and it's uh, drafted by uh, uh, VJ at CertCC. Let me see if I can paste the GitHub link in uh, the chat now, uh, and um, and I'll send a uh, a link to this. Uh, so while you are looking, so the CA CSAF, which is a format for machine readable security advisories, is looking into supporting SBOM and CSAF 2.0. What do you recommend to use one standard, one standard since they are convertible or all of them? 
That's a great question. And in fact, we're going to be meeting uh, with Omar Santos, who's the chair of that effort this week, later this week. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, we take a position of being radically ecumenical. And as Tomo mentioned, it's not our job to, to sort of say this one is the best, but we're happy to present the strengths and weaknesses uh, or, or introduce you representatives from each of those formats. And if, if they decide that one's the better starting point, that's fine. Tell me, you have any other uh, thoughts on that? We're like out of time, sorry. Oh, thanks, so, sorry. <laughs> sorry, we're gonna have to cut this off. So thank you, Alan and Tomo again for your speaking and thank you for all the participants for dropping by and listening to this presentation today. Um, so after this, I think there's a short break and after that we'll reconvene to your session. So please jump on to your next session when the time comes. So thank you all and have a great day and great, great conference. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.